Understanding the brain is one of the last great challenges that we face. We've been to the moon, we've split the atom, we've sequenced the human genome, but we're still at the very beginning of our understanding of how the brain drives behavior. To achieve this, we need to be able to link different levels of brain function. And over the past few years, we've made great progress in using functional imaging techniques to identify which brain areas are active in the human brain during behavior. But these techniques lack the resolution to provide an understanding on the level of the underlying machinery of the brain. The level of neural circuits, the level of single neurons, the level of synapses, and the level of the underlying molecules. And let me give you an example of how we can link these different levels. Let me introduce you to the prairie vole. So, Unlike most mammals, the prairie vole is monogamous. It mates for life, and the males share in the raising of pups. Now, let me introduce you to the montane vole. It looks almost the same as the prairie vole, but its behavior is completely different. So, whereas the male prairie vole behaves like the ideal husband, the male montane vole behaves more like a Casanova. So, Montean voles are promiscuous, they don't form durable pair bonds, and the males abandon pregnant females. And what's remarkable is that these striking differences in the behavior of these two kinds of moles have been traced to a single gene encoding a single neurotransmitter receptor. So if you put the gene for, from the prairie vole into the montean vole, you can transform the behavior of the montean vole from Casanova-like to ideal husband-like. And it's experiments like these that give us hope that we can understand complex behaviors, such as mating behavior, on the level of the underlying molecules driving activity in neural circuits. But it's crucial not just to identify the underlying molecules, we need to understand the neural code. And to understand the neural code, we need to be able to measure activity in neural circuits and to be able to understand how that activity drives behavior. So to understand the neural code, we need two basic ingredients. First of all, we need to understand the timing of activity in the neural circuit. For example, we need to know whether information is represented in terms of the average spike rate, the action potential rate in individual cells, or whether the millisecond timing of individual action potentials is actually important. Next, we need to also understand the spatial dimensions. We need to know within neural circuits which neurons are active at which time. So to understand the neural code, we basically need to measure activity in neural circuits and understand the precise sequence of activity as it spreads through neural circuits during behavior. And in today's talk, I'm going to tell you about a revolution in neuroscience that has come from an unexpected source. And I'm going to tell you about two simple creatures that have yielded new tools for both monitoring and manipulating activity in neural circuits. First, I'll tell you about Equora Victoria, which is known to you as the jellyfish. And then I'm going to tell you about Chlamydomonas reinhardti, which is known to you as green algae or pond scum. So let's start with the jellyfish. So the jellyfish. <coughs> have this beautiful ring of fluorescence. And the functional role of this fluorescence is unknown, although it's thought to be involved in a set of behaviors known as the three Fs, fighting, feeding, and mating. Now, the Nobel Prize in 2008 was awarded to these, these three scientists who identified the, and purified the protein that's responsible for this ring of fluorescence which they named green fluorescent protein. And they showed that the gene encoding this protein could be inserted into any mammalian cell and harmlessly um, allow it to be fluorescent. So it's a fantastic way to express a fluorescent marker in any mammalian cell. And they also showed that by tinkering with the structure of this protein, you, you can produce a wide range of different colors, fluorescent colors for labeling cells. So in the meantime, we've managed to make transgenic animals, for example, transgenic mice, expressing green fluorescent protein um, in specific sets of cells. 
And here's an example of transgenic fish, rainbow colored transgenic fish, which you can obtain from any pet shop. Moreover, you can now use this approach to look at the structure of neural circuits. For example, here's GFP expressed in a specific set of cells in the cerebellar cortex, the Purkinje cells. And the advantage of this is that it, it essentially labels and allows you to look at the fine structure of cells within the incredibly dense forest of neurons in intact neural circuits. Jeff Lichtman and his colleagues at Harvard have developed a clever trick for recombining different colored fluorescent proteins in individual cells. And they've used this to produce a transgenic mouse known as the rainbow mouse, where individual cells have a rainbow of colors. And this not only uh, is incredibly beautiful, this is a, a circuit in the cerebral cortex, but it's also incredibly useful because if each cell and each axon has its own color, it makes it much easier for you to trace each axon to its target, which is gonna be very important for defining the wiring diagram of neural circuits and defining what's known as the connectome. So the entire pattern of connectivity in neural circuits, which is very important for understanding how neural circuits work. But it gets better because if you take GFP and you add a calcium binding domain to the protein, you can turn it into a genetically encoded calcium sensor. And we know that neural activity is linked to calcium increases. And so by expressing these sensors in specific sets of cells, you can yield a reporter for activity in those cells. Here's an example of how we're using this in my lab. We've expressed a genetically encoded calcium sensor known as GCAMP5, developed by Lauren Luger at Genelia Farm, in a set of cells in the motor cortex of a mouse. And here what we're gonna do is we're gonna image the activity of these neurons by imaging the calcium signals reported by this calcium sensor. So this is a, a, a movie showing you the flashes, flashes of light in individual neurons in the motor cortex, in an, an awake animal, in the intact brain, as the animal is performing movement. So this really allows us a, a wonderful new insight into the patterns of activity in a neural circuit of an animal during behavior. Now these imaging techniques are also complemented by new electrophysiological techniques from re for recording from specific cells during behavior. And here's a, a, a setup that we've built in my lab uh, inspired by the work of Florian Hölscher in Tübingen and David Tank at Princeton, where we have a mouse sitting on top as what's known as a spherical tread treadmill, which is basically a styrofoam ball which is f floating on a bed of air so it doesn't have any friction. And the mouse can run freely on top of this ball and we place the whole thing inside a virtual reality environment, a large uh, sphere, where we can project this world with a, a conventional video projector and the mouse can then navigate within this virtual world and perform behavioral tasks. And the mice are, get very good at this very quickly. He, um, you can see here with this, this speedometer here that the mouse is actually moving very nicely and quickly throughout this environment, throughout this maze, towards this green target where it's gonna pick up a reward. And they very happily do this. And the remarkable thing about this is that at the same time as the, the mouse is performing this behavior, we can make an electrophysiological recording, a patch comp recording from a single neuron in the cerebral cortex. This is now showing you the kind of data that we can get. This is now the behavior, uh, the readout of running speed, and this is now the activity of the single pyramidal cell recorded with our electrophysiological patch clamp recording. You can see we can record not only the, the spiking activity with extremely high temporal res resolution, but we also have extreme sensitivity. We can, we can also see the uh, inputs that are driving the spiking activity. So I've shown you uh, new approaches for recording, monitoring the activity of specific cells in intact neural circuits during behavior. But that's, that's not enough. We also need to be able to manipulate the activity of defined sets of cells if we want to understand the neural code because we need to be able to make causal links between patterns of activity in specific sets of cells and behavior. Now I'd like to introduce you to our second wonderful creature that has yielded a new tool for manipulating activity in neurons. This is Chlamydomonas here, known as green algae, uh, the major component of pond scum. And this is really a wonderful creature because it has these two little flagella that allow it to swim in a breaststroke-like manner through the water. And it's remarkable because this creature shows phototaxis, so it moves towards the light and the molecule 
that is responsible for this phototaxis has been identified and has been cloned. It's known as channel rhodopsin. And it's been shown to be a membrane protein that acts as a channel, which when it receives blue light, when it's activated by blue light, produces a current which can be used to drive activity. And it's been shown that this channel rhodopsin can be harmlessly expressed in mammalian neurons, rendering them sensitive to blue light. So you can take control of the activity of these neurons with blue light. Here's an example of how we're using this in my lab. What we'd like to do is we'd like to control the activity of specific sets of pyramidal cells in the cortex. And here we're using an approach called single cell electroporation to deliver the DNA encoding for both GFP to mark the cells and channel rhodopsin to control the activity of these cells in the intact brain. And the way we do this is basically by uh, bringing a, a small glass pipette, very fine to pipette, up onto the uh, individual uh, cortical pyramidal cells and using a voltage pulse to inject the DNA into the cells. And um, those of you from my generation will recognize the sounds are from um, Star Wars. <coughs> and so just like a video game, basically, we can shoot up individual pyramidal cells um, with the DNA for GFP and channel rhodopsin. We can come back a couple of days later, image the cells, which are now expressing both GFP and channel rhodopsin. We can record from one of these cells. And you can see now um, in these traces from the electrophysiological recording, when we apply very brief pulses of blue light, millisecond pulses of blue light, we can control the activity of this neuron with extremely high temporal precision, with a millisecond precision that we think may be important for the neural code. And now the next step is um, to link this to behavior. And this um, approach has now yielded actually a whole new field known as optogenetics, opto because it involves light activated proteins, and genetic because it um, involves use of DNA targeted to genetically defined cells. And it enables a, a whole host of wonderful new experiments to become possible. So let me show you um, a couple of proof of principle experiments. First of all, from the work of uh, Gary Miesenbuch's lab, uh, now at Oxford, who has <coughs> uh, used an optogenetic approach to express an optogenetic probe um, in the neurons controlling flight um, in the common fly. Here we have two flies. One is um, a, a control fly, and one is a fly which is expressing the optogenetic probe um, in the neurons controlling flight. And you can see here that when we apply um, a flash of light, the fly basically takes off. Um, here's an example of how we can use an optogenetic strategy in the mammalian brain. This is from Carl Dothero's lab at Stanford. He's expressed channel rhodopsin in sets of neurons in the motor cortex on one side of the brain. He delivers the blue light with a fiber optic probe. And you can see here that basically the animal is initially resting here. And when we apply uh, the blue light through the fiber optic probe, the animal rapidly starts circling in this environment, showing that um, we have now light control of activity in a specific set of cells to drive behavior. So <clears throat> ultimately, we aim to use this approach to crack the neural code. And one key experiment that's going to be very important for this is to be able to express the molecules both for recording and for manipulating activity in the same sets of cells. So to express a calcium sensor and an optogenetic probe, such as channel rhodopsin, in the same cells. And the dream experiment here is to first record the spatiotemporal pattern of activity of these neurons during behavior, and then use the optogenetic probe to replay the same pattern of activity in the same set of cells. And then that will show us if we can make a causal link between this particular pattern of activity and the resulting behavior. And we can also use the millisecond control we have over the timing of the spikes to test different kinds of neural codes to see, for example, the precision of spike timing that's necessary to drive the behavior correctly. So we think that um, by examining and cracking the neural code in different neural circuits, a whole range of exciting experiments will now become possible. We think we should be able to manipulate movements by expressing optogenetic probes in motor areas of the brain. By expressing these probes in sensory areas of the brains, we may be able to create sensations. For example, may be able to help to restore vision. By expressing the probes in areas where memories are stored, we think we may be able to recall memories or manipulate memories. 
And by expressing the probes in decision-making parts of the brain, we may be able to also sway decisions. And by understanding how the neural code is implemented in these different behaviors in the relevant neural circuits, we hope to reach a new level of understanding that may also help us develop new treatments for diseases involving the brain, perhaps even using the kind of new approaches and the new tools that I've been describing in my talk. So the next, hit, next decade promises to be an incredibly exciting time for neuroscience, in particular because these new tools should provide fundamental new insights into the link between neural circuits and behavior. Thank you. <laughs>